So share my screen. Um, were there any questions from last time? Last time we were doing the brick layout, so that was all of these are actions that you would do in Rhino, but instead you're just doing it in Grasshopper and then inputting different variables in. So we made a box and then we had two linear arrays. We moved one of them sideways and up. Um, we got rid of every other one so that it would be the correct brick pattern of kind of offset rows. Um, and then we took the random number generator and moved each one a little bit in the y direction um, to make it the depth kind of jittery in both for both arrays. If there are any questions we can go on. Or... Okay. Um, so we have two more to do. The um, one we'll do next is this one. So it's a um, lattice coming from a loft of two uh, curves. So we'll make the curves and then we'll loft the curves. We'll loft between the curves, which creates a surface that connects the curve. And then we'll contour that surface. So we'll add lines in the vertical and horizontal directions and we'll um, pipe the, those lines. So we'll um, add thickness to those. Uh, surfaces or to those contours. So we can start off by talking about um, parameters. So, so far we've talked about actions that you can do. You can make a point or you make a box. Um, and we've used a lot of number sliders which in some sense are kind of like a thing. They're a number that you're um, inputting. You can also have other things that you input into, um, into your actions as well. So we're going to use two curves. We're just gonna make the curves in Rhino and then we're going to um, add them to Grasshopper and use them in Grasshopper. But we're, we're going to make them as normal in Rhino. Um, so in Rhino, oh, to reopen Grasshopper, if you saved both a Grasshopper and a Rhino file, then usually the easiest way is to open the Rhino file and then type in Grasshopper and open the Grasshopper file. If you just saved a Grasshopper file, then you can just double click on the Grasshopper file and it should open a random Rhino file as well. Does everybody have Rhino open and is ready to go? Okay. So the first step is in Rhino, we're going to um, make two curves. One of them is gonna be the top and the other one's gonna be the bottom. So um, I'm just drawing, I'm, I'm doing a curve and I'm drawing a random shape. I'm in perspective view, but it doesn't really matter. Top view is fine. And I'm gonna draw another shape right on top of it. I'm going to move these to a different layer because white is not the best color. For this. Okay, so now we want to take these lines that we made in Rhino and add them to Grasshopper. And how we do that, we type in curve. We'll double click to get that. Um, enter a search keyword box to come up. You double click on the anywhere on the canvas and then just type in curve and we'll need to, so this works. Um, and these are just things. So they represent um, geometry um, or in the case of number sliders, numbers and other things that will be inputs to actions later. Right now they're um, orange and that means that something's wrong. It's because we haven't assigned any curves to these um, parameters. So to do that, we'll right click on curve, 
and we'll go down to set one curve. It'll open up or it'll uh, tell us in Rhino to select a curve or edge to reference. We'll select one of them. Um, so then that curve went to being white. So that's good. And we'll do it on the second one the same way. If we wanted to set multiple curves all to the same reference, then we would go to set multiple curves. Um, but we're just setting one for each. So now we have both of them. Each curve, if you click on them, it'll highlight the curve. So each each parameter um, is associated with one curve in Rhino. Everybody have that? Okay. One other thing that is not strictly necessary, but is really helpful is if you right click and go to internalize data, that will take the geometry that's in Rhino. Before it was, it was just referencing what was in Rhino, but if you do internalize data, it will actually bring the data into Grasshopper and you can do anything with the Rhino data. You can delete it, you can not open the Rhino file and it'll still work in Grasshopper if you internalize the data. So if I internalize both of these data sources um, and I select the Rhino lines and delete them, they're, they're still there in Grasshopper because um, I've internalized the data. So you don't have to do that, but it can be nice um, a lot of times. So we have two lines that are on the same plane because I wasn't worried about what plane they should be on, um, but we want one of them to be um, brought up to the height of the wall. So we're going to use the move command again. Uh, we'll double click and type in move. And you might remember this from last um, time, but we have a geometry that we want to move and a transform, which is how much, or a motion, which is a T, which is uh, how much we want it to move and in what direction. So the geometry is gonna be one of these curves. And automatically the T is set to be a unit Z vector, so one unit in the up direction. Uh, and that's good, but just to make sure we'll um, do unit Z because we want to factor it, um, because we want it to be any number of heights, we'll do a unit Z um, vector to make our number in the Z direction. And then we'll also need a number. Um, so you might remember from last time, you can either type in number slider so number slider, or you can type in a minimum, what you want it to be, and a maximum, the start, the start value is the middle one, um, surrounded by uh, is less, is greater than, is less than. <laughs> uh, so if we do zero is less than, uh, let's say we want it to be 10 at the beginning, is less than 50. We have a number slider that's at 10, the bottom is zero, the top is 50, and we connect, connect that to the unit Z vector. So this is taking 10 and multiplying it by a vector in the Z direction that is one. So it's one times 50 is 50. It's a Z vector um, that's up 50. So we're moving this geometry up 50. Does that make sense to everyone? I have a question. Um, yeah. Mine are orange. Like my connections are orange. Um, which piece is orange? Like the line connecting the different boxes. Um, are any of the uh, actions or um, parameters set to not be enabled? Um, if I disable some of these, that turns these orange. Is that what's happening? Right click and click enabled to see. No, it's enabled. Uh, do you want to share your screen for a second? Yeah, I can. All right, can you see it? Yeah, they're just orange. Hmm. 
Oh, um, so this is another feature that is uh, kind of nice. We haven't used it because um, we're doing kind of simpler things, but when you have a really complex um, grasshopper script, it's nice to not recalculate everything every time you change something. Uh, so right now you have a lock solver on, so you can connect as many things as you want and um, it won't do anything in Rhino. Um, but then when you recalculate, it'll recalculate everything and that just like saves time while you're working. Um, so if you right click and click on lock solver, that has turned it off. So now, um, now you're back to it recalculating every time you change something. Okay. Uh, you also have your unit Z disabled. So if you enable that one. Yep. Okay. Does that make sense? You yeah. don't really need that now, but um, in the future, if you are doing something and it's taking, it's, it's lagging every time you move, you might want to lock the solver and recompute it afterwards. Okay. Okay, so we have these two curves. Now one of them is on the ground and the other one is moved in the air and we can change how far it's moved in the air. Um, so we can turn off the top curve, um, the view of it on the ground. We can right click and click on preview. Um, so then we see the bottom curve and the top curve, but only in the air. So now we want to loft between them. We want to create a surface. Just like in Rhino, you locked something and then you select two um, curves to lock between. We'll do the same thing, so locked. And we have curves as a list and options. Options, the defaults are fine, um, but for the curves, we want two curves. So we want the top curve, which is the geometry from the move. This is the output geometry, so we'll connect that. And then we also have this bottom curve we also want it connected to the loft. If we just connect it normally, it'll um, disable the geometry from the move. So you can't have two at once unless you click on shift. So I'll uh, drag, click on shift and keep holding shift as I let go and it'll connect to um, input and that will lock the surface. Does everyone see that? Okay, um, so we have this surface. We can turn off the uh, lines. I'll unpreview both the top and bottom lines just to it's housekeeping. Um, we have this surface and we want to create a bunch of lines in the vertical direction and a bunch of lines in the horizontal direction. Um, to do that, we can use the contour command, which is another command in Rhino that you can also do in Grasshopper. So contour. Um, and you can kind of see by the um, icons, this first one is seems like it's for um, lines. The next one is for surfaces, which is what we want. The next two seem to be um, only in the, or along a plane, but we're fine with the, um, this one that shows it on a surface and whichever direction um, we need. So this is the one we'll choose. Um, so there are four inputs. The first one is the shape to contour. We'll select the loft. And actually we can do these both at the same time. We need horizontal contours and vertical contours. So we'll just take two of the contours, two, two contour uh, actions um, and do those individually. Um, so if we, to copy this, either you can double click and type in contour again, or you can drag this, then click Alt and let go, and it'll create another contour um, box action. Um, so that also copied the shape, which is what we want. We want, we want the same loft to do both the vertical and the horizontal. The next one is the start point. 
Um, so we have this uh, we have this line at the bottom, and we can get the start and end points, and that's where we can start the the um, contours. We could also take um, the surface and get one of the edge points, but this is an easy way to do it. Uh, if we do end points and connect this curve, we get a start point and an end point. You'll see it shows up on the um, Rhino as two X's. Um, so we'll take the start point. The contour just needs these to see exactly where to start the first line, and then it can kind of um, add to that after that. Um, so we'll take the start point just as one random point to start, and we'll add it to both contours. The direction is a, um, is how far we want each uh, contour to go up. So let's get some number sliders so that we can, so that it can uh, vary and we can change it. First, we'll make one that goes from zero to two to five. And if we add 0, 0.0 when we type in the first, the minimum value and click enter, it'll add 0, 0.0 to um, the slider and we'll have um, finer control. You can also edit that by double clicking on the slider and using real numbers instead of natural numbers and increasing the digits. We'll rename this one to, I guess we can rename the first one to height. So I'll right click on factor and change it to height. I'll right click on this new one and change it to horizontal gap. And I'll click and drag this then click alt and let go. And I'll create another one so then I can do vertical. So one of these contours, we want to go in the horizontal direction. The other one, we want to be vertical. Um, so um, we, we have two more. We have a direction and a distance. Sorry, I think I said the direction was um, the numbers. The distance is the distance between, and the direction is the vector. Um, so for the... Um, vertical gap uh, we already have a unit z it doesn't matter how big the unit z is it doesn't matter what the factor amount is uh, because it also has a distance so the the n is just the direction so we can connect this unit z to the n and we can connect the vertical gap to the d which is the distance and it'll create these contours and we can change it and it'll change the distance between them then for the uh, horizontal gap, we can uh, do a unit um, x vector. So we don't, we don't have a unit z vector to use. So we'll just create a new one in the x direction because that's what we want the um, horizontal contours to line up with. We'll connect that to n and horizontal gap to d. And that will create lattices in the vertical direction. So we have our contours. We can unpreview the loft, so we just see the lattices. Uh, we can turn off the endpoints, and we can, I had turned on this initial curve, so I'll turn that back off. So now we just see the contours. Now, to create some thickness on these lines, we will um, use pipe. So pipe is also a command in Rhino. If we double click and type in pipe, there's a pipe that's kind of simple and will just create a single radius along the entirety of all of your lines. There's also a pipe variable. We can try that one. 
Um, it also has four inputs. The first one is curved. So we want both of these, we want both sets of contours to be piped. Um, so we'll take the C from the first contour. And then just like we did for the loft, we need another contour to go into that same one. So we'll have to click shift. It'll show this uh, green arrow and the plus sign. And both of them should um, be let in. So now we need, uh, we can get rid of the last one. The last one is caps. So we can right click on that and it has kind of a list that we can choose from. Um, so it's right now it's none. It doesn't matter. We can choose round. And that means that the end of the pipes will be capped um, as hemispheres. Um, and then we have these two in the middle, which are the radii and the parameters. So um, it's saying along the length of the line, uh, you have the first radius, which might be at zero, and then 25% uh, of the way along the line, we want another radius, then 50% of the way along the line, we want another radius, um, and we can specify as many of those as we want. So we need two lists. We need one list that's the um, percentage of the way along the line, and we need another, which is the radii that we want. So we can do this lots of different ways. The easiest might be a panel though. Um, so to do that, you double click, you can type in panel, or you can type in um, just a quote and you can start typing, but we'll just do a quote and enter. And we want to create a list. So uh, this first one is going to be, um, the, the parameter is uh, like the percent along the line, but um, we'll do that by using decimals. So the first one will be at 0%, then at 30% or 0.3, then at 70% or 0.7, and then at one. And if we let go, we see it as just kind of a block of text, but we want it to be four different items. So to tell Grasshopper to do that, we right click and click multi-line data. Don't ask me why it says it's already checked and then you click it and it turns into multi-line data and it looks like it's not checked, but whatever. Um, if you click that, it should show up um, as a list of things with indices on the um, left side. So we have this, let's do it again. We'll double click and do a quote for a panel. Now these are the radii that we want to correspond to 0, 30, 70, and 100%. Um, so just typing in random numbers. Uh, random radii, we could, we could specify um, number sliders for these and other things, but we won't worry about that. We just have a list. Uh, and then again, right click and click multi-lane data, and it'll create uh, um, a list of four items. So we'll connect the first, this uh, list of percents kind of to T, and we'll connect the list of um, radii to R. And it's kind of weird right now because um, it's just doing it to this really tiny segment. And that's because it doesn't know that we want um, this T value to go from zero to one along the length of the um, contour. So right now, zero is here, one is here, and then the rest of the contour is into the hundreds or whatever. Um, so to take, if, if this is zero and this is a hundred, we want to take that and make this zero and this one. We wanna stretch out the parameters. So if we right click on contours, so we have the, these two contour, um, actions, the output of those is these curves, the contours as curves. If we right click on the output C and click reparameterize, that will, the reparameterize function or uh, output adjuster um, will take the list of um, points along the length and instead of going from zero to something else, it'll go from zero to one it'll reset it to be zero to one. 
So then that means that our percentages will work. So it'll be 30%, 70%. So at 30%, it looks like it's uh, 0.4. And then at 70%, it goes back down to 0.2. And we'll also click the C output for the other contour and reparameterize that. So we haven't used these before. These output adjusters are um, something that it'll, it'll take the output that um, the action gives and then adjust it. So it'll reparameterize it or something. And anything that uses that output will have the, the adjusted value. So it'll, um, this C input will take both reparameterized um, outputs. Do we have that? Usually when you see a lowercase t, that's a good sign that you'll, um, it'll be helpful to reparameterize. Um, so t is for parameters, it's for those percentages. And unless you want to decide what the parameters are, are along the length, it's usually easiest to get it to, from zero to one. And then it's much easier to work with. Um, the only other thing that's on uh, the list or the, the annotated um, guide below is to connect it to this move out here, which will take, so this, uh, these pipe lines, it'll take the um, lines and move them um, to a random area. If we, or, sorry, if we enable this move, That'll move it to out here, um, just so it's out of the way. And we can get rid of these previews. Don't want to see the contours anymore. So now we're back to zero. You could also select everything that we worked on, right click somewhere off of the actions, um, but just on the blank canvas and click disable and that'll disable everything. James, I'm curious, even though I disabled all the previews um, other than V pipe, I can still see a contour. And if I like try to move it or delete it, I don't, I don't like everything is dark gray, but I still see the original contours I drew in Rhino. Is that, um, that's probably the shape that you drew in Rhino and then you added it to the um, curve. Mm -hmm. um, so if you internalize that data to Grasshopper, then you can delete it oh, in Rhino. That was like the one thing you said that I was like, whatever, I'll do that later. Yeah, okay. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> so if you internalize that and then delete it, it should you can you can delete the Rhino and it'll still look like the same in Grasshopper. So. Perfect. Thank you. Um, any questions on this one, or we can move on to the third and final. I'm swiping through people and I don't see anything. So, okay. Um, so this last one is um, we'll look at color. Um, we will um, use some of the weirder functions of um, Grasshopper um, that can just create real um, patterns. Um, you can use this example in the way that I'm making it, or um, you could take other shapes and kind of repeat them and um, colorize them based on um, values. Um, so I think this one is this one can be expanded in different ways when you're if if this is what you wanted to kind of work off of um, for your final. Uh, so I disabled both of the first two examples. Um, so we'll start working here. And the first thing is we're going to create a box to fit all of these shapes in. Um, I don't know, I can show the final result so that we have an idea of what we're working toward. So this is the um, final that I have. Um, it's a bunch of 
randomly generated uh, solids, and then we'll scale those down um, based on the size and things, and then we'll change the color based on the, um, where they are. Um, so first thing, we have to create the box, and then we create we can create the random shapes. So disable this preview. Um, and we can start by creating a bounding box. Uh, if we type in box, there are a bunch of different ones, but um, let's do a center box. That'll center the box on um, the origin of the plane. And uh, we can type in some inputs. We've used a lot of number sliders, so instead let's just um, set uh, values with panel. If we do um, a quote and then type in 100, then click enter, it'll create a box that just has 100, and we can connect that to X. If we do a quote and two, that'll create a box with a two. And, uh, do 25 as the height, quote 25, and as the Z. That'll create a narrow box that looks kind of like um, a wall. Uh, you don't have to do this, but interestingly, you can internalize this data too. So you can right click on X and click internalize data, and it'll get rid of the line between that, those two because this 100 is no longer needed. We can delete the 100 and it's still 100 long. Um, if you right click and um, then you can um, set a number. So if I click set number, it'll have 100. I can change that to 50, commit changes, and it'll change it to 50, just like if I change the panel to 50 and there was a line between them. It does the same thing, um, but it's just cleaner if it's internalized. But it's a lot easier to see when you're just starting out, when you can see all of them. So let's we I'm can just keep the panel. I'm getting error message on mine that says that data conversion failed from text to number. Um, do you have anything written in the panel that's not? Uh, are, is there like an extra space? I don't think so. Mm. Hold on. Yeah, we're return. Gonna... Okay. Are you good? Was that the problem? Yes, I'm good now. Thank you. Okay. Um, so the next thing we need to do is find the points that'll be the center for our um, for our solids. You could input a list that corresponded to your architectural design, or we can populate 3D random points. Um, so pop 3D is just creates a random um, assortment of points within a region. We can use the bounding box as the region. So that's the first thing. And the count, um, we could specify a count, but this seems like a good amount of um, points. We could specify zero to 10 to 200 and put that in N for the count and bring that up to, I don't know, 80. But it already had, uh, um, it already has this randomly, it has one locally defined value of 100 if you um, hover over it. And that's probably fine. It doesn't matter. You can you can specify one or not. The seed, um, we talked about this a little bit last time. This is just a the like there are a bunch of lists that are kind of pseudo random numbers. Um, and this is seeing which list to take from kind of. Um, so we can connect anything we want. And if we change that thing, it'll change um, the assortment. Um, the points as a list that would, if we wanted to input a certain 
list of points we could, but we, we just want them random. So this is good. Um, and then to create the actual shapes, uh, we can use a bunch of different things, but the one that I'm interested is in is the uh, Voronoi shape. Um, so if we do Voronoi, and let's do 3D because of the box. Um, this kind of will draw circles starting at each point and expand those circles until it reaches the other point circle and it'll create lines where those things meet. So it'll kind of make shapes based on the points as big as they can be until they hit other shapes that were created by other points. Uh, so we have a point list as an output and a point list as an input, so we plant those. And the box, so this box that we used for the points, we can use again for the solid. And if we right click on population 3D and on preview and the same with the box, we will see just the shapes, just the solid shapes. So I don't know if my um, description made sense, but um, you're, it's taking these points and kind of drawing circles around them. And then when the two circles meet, it'll create a line at this point. So these, this circle is here, this circle is here, and those points met and it created a line and that kind of dragged out to the corners. So anywhere in this shape, the closest point is this point. Anywhere in this shape, the closest point is this point. It doesn't really matter that you know that, but just an interesting kind of way to create shapes. And there are lots of other ones that you can explore more in Grasshopper. I'm just going to delete this so that it's out of our way. That was from last time. Um, so, Let's, the next step that we want to do is to kind of shrink the biggest shapes. Um, I don't know, maybe you want to put glass in the crack between them, or I don't know, um, just an, something to kind of change based on the size of the shapes. So to get the size of the shapes, we need the area. We'll do area. And we have the list of um, cells. So the area finds the area and also the centroid. The centroid is, we kind of already have that with the um, points that we used as the beginning, but um, if you have other random shapes, the centroid can be really helpful. That'll create the, or find the center point based on the solids mass. Um, then we want to sort the areas. We want only the biggest areas. So we'll do sort. And we'll do, I think, sort list. Yeah, sort list is takes a bunch of values, and it can also take keys. So keys are what we sort by, values are what we sort. I think we had one of these in the brick example. Um, but what we're doing is we're sorting areas by area. So both of these can be the same thing. We want to connect the area to the key and to the values. Then as an output, we have both the values and the keys. But since we were connecting both of them to the beginning, they're both the same um, at the output. So it doesn't matter which one we choose. Um, so right now, if we hover over A, it has a bunch of values from smallest to largest. And we want it to be largest to smallest. So we'll do reverse reverse list, we'll input the values from the sort, and the output of this should be the largest values to the smallest values. We're getting a little bit close to this, um, these things that I had. Uh, something that could be useful if you want. Um, whereas usually you're trying to copy something, so you click Alt after you start dragging it, if you click Alt and then drag, it'll add space in the canvas. So um, 
that can be kind of helpful. I think if you click shift, it'll add space or uh, I think it's as you can see, I never use this feature. Um, I usually just uh, select everything and move it. But um, you can you can add space to the canvas that way if you'd like to. Um, but now that we have space in the canvas, uh, we want to select a number of items. Um, I think it's Alt. Is that it? Alt will get you to uh, slide in the horizontal. Oh, button. sorry, I thought that's for you. There's the, something will get you to slide in the vertical direction as well. Gotcha. Oh, Sorry. oh, you. I'm not exactly sure. I'll have to look it up if anybody's interested. Mm -hmm. um, you have to click it again. You have to click all again. It's not working for me. I don't know. It's fine. Um, I'm glad it works for you. <laughs> um, so now we want the number of. Um, you hold alt, drag. Let go of Alt while you're still dragging. Hold Alt again, and it'll sh it'll switch up to the. Sierra was right. It did it for me too. Yeah, Sierra. don't let go and then hit Alt again. I'm doing oh, it. It might be a Alt to, tap alt to okay. separate toggle direction and to toggle separation. I'm not sure. <laughs> Is it because you're on a Mac? No, I think that's it, it still it still showed up with the option for him. I yeah. just think yeah. Mac doesn't Mac mean <laughs> Mac doesn't listen. <laughs> Apple doesn't like us. Yeah. Um well I'm glad it worked for all of you. Um uh, so either do that or just move everything. Um but now we need the the things that we're going to scale. Uh, so if we take, uh, so we have this list of the areas. We can take one of those areas and compare all the other areas. Anything bigger than whatever we select will get scaled. Everything smaller will stay the same. So to get one area to compare to, uh, we need a list item. So list item. We have a list which is this reverse list. Then we need an index. The last one is wrap. So if the index is more than the number of the, the total number of items in the list, then it'll go back to zero and start over. But the default is fine. Um, so this index value will take, um, we'll have a number slider. Let's do it from negative one. You'll see why I did that in a second. It's less than, um, uh, let's start it at seven is less than, I think the total number that we had, or the total number I had was 71. Um, let's, let's just do 70. So this is a slider of the, the seventh biggest shape is what we'll compare to. So we'll connect that to index. Um, so this item is the seventh biggest shape. Um, so now we want to compare the other shapes to that to see if they're bigger or smaller. And to do that, we'll use the evaluate command. So I don't know if um, you've used Excel, but in Excel, you can like type in formulas, and that's kind of what we are doing for this expression. There's an expression editor. They can be a lot more simple. They can be a lot simpler than Excel. They can also be like if then statements, things like that, um, just like in Excel and other programs. Um, but I think Excel is kind of a common one that people know. Um, but so we're connecting this item to Y and connecting the, 
areas. We don't want the sorted areas. We want the initial areas, so the areas here, because this is this is the initial list, which we can go back to and stuff. Um, the sorted one will be sorted in a way that isn't as helpful to us. Um, so we have two inputs. We have the x, which is all of the um, all of the solids, and then we have y, which is the solid we want to compare to, compare the area to. Um, and so for the expression, we want it to be, we, we right click on the F and then in the expression editor, we do um, Y, which is, or let's do X. X is less than Y. So this means if X is less than Y, it'll put that in the output. If X is more than Y, it won't add it to the output. Or it'll, it'll select a false. Um, if we use a panel and connect the output to that panel, we can see um, the list of outputs. So most of those things are true. And then there should be, I think, seven that are false. Um, so this has evaluated whether each thing that we input in X, each area is larger or smaller than the area of the seventh largest. And the output is true and false. So now we need to take those true and false and actually sort them. If we use SIFT, SIFT pattern, dispatch is another thing that you could use, um, but we'll use SIFT pattern. Um, in the annotated guide, there's a dispatch command that you could play around with, but um, we'll use SIF pattern. We'll connect the um, true and false values to the pattern. And then we'll connect the uh, L, which is the list, to area. So area to L. So this will take the areas. And based on whether the corresponding value in the pattern is true or false, it'll put it into the zero or the one, the true or the false. And for the zeros, we'll want to scale them. Scale. If we do a scale, it'll scale in all three dimensions. We just want to scale in two dimensions because we want the thickness of the wall to stay the same. So scale and U will allow us to select a scale that's separate for the X, Y, and Z directions. We'll take the input from the false, the zeros, and put that as the geometry for the scale. The plane, um, we want the plane, right now the plane is at zero, zero, zero for everything. Let's do everything else and we'll come back to the plane um, because we can see it better what, what the issue is uh, if we wait. So let's create another number slider. Again, I like to keep my um, adjustments over here so that I can see all of them at the same time um, and change, change the adjustments all at the same time. Uh, so I never named this one, so we'll name this one. This one was from before. This is the number of shapes to scale. And we also want a number slider that goes um, the, so let's set it from zero to, let's start at 0.8 and go to one. So if we want it at hundred percent scaled, then nothing will happen. It'll just stay the same zero percent scaled. It'll get rid of the, those, um, shapes that are bigger. Um, so if we keep it at 0.8, we'll rename it to, um, scale of the biggest shapes. We can connect it to the X value and the Y value. Um, so eventually we're going to get planes that are um, that are aligned with these shapes vertically. 
so we want, because the planes are aligned vertically, uh, we want the X and Y's in those planes and the Z is the depth dimension. Um, it's failing to convert number to geometry. Suspect that might be a problem with the sift. Um, in the guide, yes, okay. Um, so we were taking, where are we back up here? Um, we were taking um, the area numbers, but we will actually want is the geometries. So instead of taking it from the A, we want it from the C. And uh, I definitely mess up more than I do in this tutorial. Um, in real life, because when I'm using Grasshopper, it's a it's really process in, um, of uh, trial and error. And um, even though sometimes I've been messing up on the, on the tutorial, it's not like a an accurate representation of how easily it happens. Often you'll have to try something, you'll have to delete actions, um, but this kind of thing happens all the time. So we have a bunch of shapes, but instead of scaling into themselves they're scaling toward this center point. So we need each to um, have its own origin. To do that, we'll use the plane origin command. Plane origin. We'll connect it to the plane, but then we need some inputs. Um, the first input is the base plane. So that's what we want We'll, we'll take the initial plane and we'll move the origin. So if the initial, the initial plane, we'll use another, um, another thing, another parameter. If we type in plane, this is one plane that, but we, it hasn't been assigned a plane. So if we right click and set one plane, the plane that we already have is the world XY plane. We can just click on that. And this plane is now set to XY the world XY plane. So we can connect that to the B. Um, and then the origin uh, will be these centroids, these areas. That's where we want the um, end planes to be. It turns out that um, in the guide I had used, instead of selecting the world XY plane, I, if we right click on the plane, set one plane um, to the world XZ plane, that will get it to be vertical rather than horizontal. And that's actually what we want because now we see that it's scaling in the X and Y directions, and it's scaling in on itself, but not the depth. Sorry if that was confusing. So to reset that plane, we right click on plane, click set one plane, and then world Z X. So that just means the first dimension of the plane is in the X direction, or the first dimension is in the Z direction, and then the second dimension is in the X direction. Do we have this? So now we see the scaled planes and all of the, the shape, scaled shapes and all of the other shapes. Um, but we want to, we don't want to see all of the other shapes. We want to see all of the other shapes minus the ones that we've already scaled. So conveniently, that is what we have um, in the, we scaled the ones at zero, but the ones in one are the other ones. Um, so we need to combine these other ones with the newly scaled ones. To do that, we can entwine. We could also use um, merge, but I want to show you something with entwine. Um, so we'll connect one to zero zero and we'll connect G to zero one. We can disable the preview on a bunch of these so that just the entwine is showing. By the evaluation shouldn't show anything, but this is showing something. Okay. 
here's where we want. So now we have a bunch of uh, a bunch of shapes, and seven of them are scaled. If we change this, we can have almost all of them scaled. I set it to negative one because of the wrap function. So um, at zero, that's taking the biggest shape and only the biggest shape will scale. But if we go to negative one, that's not in the range of the shapes. So it'll wrap it to the other end. It'll wrap it to the smallest shape because zero is the biggest shape. And the smallest shape, when it's compared to everything else, everything else is bigger. So it'll scale everything. So it's kind of, um, I had accidentally set this to one, negative one and it had done this. So I wanted to show you that uh, there are things that are kind of hacks that will um, do weird things if you uh, do them. It's important not to use too many hacks because then it can be hard to troubleshoot, but things like this, uh, just negative one will wrap it to the other side and it'll um, do everything. You could, you could keep this scale going and do negative two and negative three, and that would kind of work our way back up to um, more shapes not being scaled. So we have this entwine, which combines both of them. We can turn off the planes too. Um, if we create a panel with um, the quotation marks and connect the entwine, and we can extend this out. We can see that instead of, so far we've only looked at one list, um, but you can see that there's a zero, zero list and a zero, one list. So this is two separate lists within one, one line. So instead of each of these only has one list, but then when there are multiple lists within a single line, it becomes dotted. Um, and this is a lot of what you'll do if you continue in Grasshopper. Um, it's, it can get kind of confusing to like flatten lists into, or flatten trees into one list, because right now this is a tree with multiple lists. Um, but you can flatten trees into one list. You can expand lists into, multi, into one tree that has a lot of lists. Um, if you'd like to explore that more, you can connect um, this entwine to over here. And you can see what happens with all these things. Um, but I won't get into it because it can get pretty confusing. But if you're interested, uh, feel free to look at that. Um, it's also in the annotated guide down here. Um, so we've combined them into one. The last thing to do is to um, connect them or to color them. So to color them, we uh, can use a color, what is it called? I can never remember what this thing is called. Uh, let's see. Color picker, nope. Uh, I probably wrote it down. Gradient, that's what it is. So we need a gradient. And that will color these shapes. Uh, we can base it off of a lot of things, but um, Let's try the distance to the center. So to do that, we need a list item which says uh, which what the um, first item is and what the last item is. I think we're running out of time, so I might um, just not actually do it, but show you in the guide if that's okay.
um, we have this gradient. If we right click on the gradient, um, we can do presets to different uh, colors. We can also, from this um, color wheel kind of thing, we can slide new colors in and edit them. So we can change the colors. Um, so we need the first list item, which it has an item index at zero, and we need the last list item, which um, will sort the, cent the um, centroids and take the length and um, so all of the length, all of the lists that we've seen go from zero to a number. So there are actually only um, or there are actually 71 items in this list because of zero. So um, this, this largest number will have to be X minus one um, to, so the length is 71, but we want it to be at 70 because of the zero. So we'll um, subtract one to get that the last index rather than the length of the list. We'll connect those to the um, first and last items. And um, we'll connect the um, centroid to the T, which is what will um, describe uh, the, the list. Let's just do do you guys mind staying a minute or two extra if that's okay? Okay, um, sorry about this, uh, but we're almost there. Um, so we're um, creating two list items. We have one list item, which will be the first list or the for first item, which is the the beginning of the slider, we'll click, click Alt and click down or uh, drag down. Um, that'll be the biggest item in the list. Um, so that'll be the other end of the slider. Um, for each of these, uh, for this first list, it says the first value we want is a zero. The other one we need to change to um, we need to um, sort the centroids. So sort, sort list. Um, we have, we've already sorted the areas, but we'll sort the centroids. Um, so we'll connect the centroids to both K and A. That's sorting the, um, these middle points based on the X, Y, and Z coordinates. We'll take the um, key values. It doesn't matter because we've assigned both of them the same values. We can take either the key values or the um, values as the list, um, but we'll find the length, um, list length, take that from the values and take that to be the biggest number. So we need we need the first number, which is zero, and the biggest number, which is the length, but it's minus one because of what I talked about. It goes from zero to 70, but the length is 71. So we need X minus one. To do that, we'll right click on the I um, and add an expression, X minus one. So it'll take X, which is the length, the input, X minus one will put as the I uh, length minus one, which is what we want. And um, 
we also need to tell it what list we're actually looking for. So we'll take the same, the same sorted list of centroids, add it to both lists. So that'll take the first value and the last value. Um, that'll find the edges of the um, gradient. And then the last thing we need is the T. So those are the actual values that we need. Um, and we'll get those from, where am I getting those? I think I'm getting those from the, this is the kind of thing that would take me uh, a while to figure out where I'm supposed to be getting everything from. Um, but if I take the, these centroids, so the unsorted centroids, so it'll take, it'll take each of these values and assign it a place along this gradient from when we sorted it, we found the smallest centroid point and the largest. So it'll sort all of these unsorted ones into this gradient. And the last thing we need to do is preview that. So preview, a custom preview. We will take uh, the material, which is the gradient, and the um, geometry, which is the shapes that we had in this entwine. And we've made it. I can select another preset. So um, we have these shapes. And the last thing we have to do is um, bake them. Just like last time, we have to um, bake them to put them back into Rhino to take the actual shapes and make them shapes in Rhino that are editable editable. Um, we can add them. I think layer two is what we already had. So if we disable these previews and if I turn on layer two, we see these shapes. Um, right now, the shapes are based on the layer color rather than on the colors that we actually want them to be. If we, in Rhino, change the view to be a render view rather than a um, shaded view, if we go to rendered, that's where, um, and I think I have something on that is, uh, I'll click everything and click disable. I must have two things on top of each other, um, but this, uh, if, you, if you color things in Grasshopper, when you bake them, you'll have to um, use a rendered view to see the colors that you chose. Does that make sense? Okay, that was all I had. Um, sorry, it took up three extra minutes. If you have any questions and can stay later, then feel free to ask or um, ask via email. Oh, I haven't been looking. Oh, that was, yeah. Um, my email is still there. Um, feel free to do that. Awesome. Thank you so much, James. I, you know, I had one super quick question. I know we're late, but I was curious. Um, well, we can, we can talk about it on a week from now because I, I also should look at the, I was gonna ask you, um, maybe we can talk about it on next Tuesday, like when you started integrating Grasshopper into your work, like what kinds of activities? Um, yeah. Maybe we can talk about that quickly then. Um, let me let me just review the assignment with you guys so you you know what you're shooting for on Tuesday and then you you can think about if there are any questions you need to ask James over email to to kind of get that started. Um, cool. Thank you, James.
You're mute. You're mute. But I think you're just saying goodbye. I'm good to go. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Yes. Thank you so okay. much. Bye. Um, have you? Did you guys take a look at the assignment online? I don't think we. All right. So let me. I'll, I'll give you the two minute review of it. Um, you're going to pick a small portion of your facade. Um, you know, just kind of where it is right now. Uh, so one facade or a portion of a larger facade. And, um, you know, I, if you look at the second paragraph here in the assignment, um, the idea is that you are, you know, think about the goals first in the same way we thought about like with atmosphere, what's the mood, you know, think about what you're trying to achieve with that facade. Are there performative goals, um, conceptual goals, whatever that is. Uh, and so once you've done that kind of thinking, um, you want to identify uh, like three variables in the facade. So that's things like we talked about in the analog assignment, you know, it could be mullion depth, mullion width, the spacing between mullions. It can be more exciting than that. That's just like a sort of baseline kind of thing to think about. Um, so some things in the geometry of that facade that you want to manipulate and then, um, and then, you know, develop that rhino model so that you can manipulate those three variables like grasshopper model. Um, and then we can talk a little bit more about how you'll format that information, but basically you want to show us the variations and be able to explain like how you uh, you know, what your grasshopper model was like, what those variables were, and how you were able to choose between those options. You know, if you have a slider from like, you know, 10 to 20 on the, you know, spacing of panes of glass, like how do you, how is it 11 versus 12? Like, how are you making these decisions? Um, is that a, enough explanation to run with right now? So think of, think, figure out the goal for the facade, what those variables are, and start to think about how to model that. Um, you know, and obviously don't make it super complicated. <laughs> Does it have to be an exterior facade or can it be an interior? No, no, it could be any. And, and, and like we were talking about with Elliot, you know, since he is, uh, I mean, you have some interior facades too, Elliot, but you could also take a, you know, you could take a skylight if you have, if that's more of an elevation than you have otherwise. Um, there was another, there was a student last year who also had a fairly embedded strategy. And so she worked with one of her skylights. Um, so, you know, do, do the thinking behind it. I think because we have James here, you know, you want to have a, a start to the model, but shoot me questions um, if you're just having trouble structuring the problem, and then we can go from there. All right. Have a good next class. I'll see you in a week. Don't miss me too much on Thursday. Thank you. Oh, and tonight is trivia night. It's one of the social nights with Nomas and Mark and I, and we have special guests. Um, Kurt Marshall is joining us and Alex Bangler is joining us and we're going to do some silly trivia. So you should join us. <laughs> you email the link for that. Um, yes. I, you know what? I, I put up the invite on my other course website. So I'm just going to throw that in the chat. One second. Trivia night. Excellent. All right. Yeah, we've been having a good group. There have been usually like 12 or more people there. So last time we played, um, uh, oh, it's the game like Mafia. Among Us? Yes, yes. All right. You all have a class, so I'm going to let you go. Bye. Mm -hmm.